How's everybody doing? There we go. That's better. We're doing good? Yeah. Mm. Alright, so let's continue on. Chapter 11. So called the peculiar institution. Um, basically, this, this is the name given to, to slavery at this time period. Más o menos the 1800 from 1860. <clears throat> um, the peculiar institution. Uh, for a couple of reasons, it was given this this, this name, Peculiar Institution. Um, first of all, um, it, it's slavery, the institution of slavery. Right, so when we talk about institution, we're talking about the people. There's not just the slaves, but the slave owners, the slave drivers, the slave traders, uh, capturers, you know, everything, right? The whole institution of slavery. Um, <clears throat> Basically, this this institution was the basis of sovereign society, and it became peculiar to the South. And when you think about the South, talking about the South of the U.S., the United States, um, anything from the Mississippi River this way, the South. Right. So this will include. Let's see, let me get a map over here real quick. Um, the border states would be Virginia, Kentucky, and then later on, Missouri. Uh, so Kentucky, Tennessee, even Virginia, that will be like the borderland between the north and the south. Uh, <clears throat> later on, the Mason-Dixie line will become the, the difference between the north and the south. And I'll, I'll write that really quick. Where is this? All right. The Mason Dixon line. That's going to become the, <clears throat> the line, excuse me, that separates the north and the south. But to get a more geographic, uh, I guess, picture in your mouth, I mean, in your mouth, in your, in your mind, uh, think about Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, and then Missouri as the main borderlands between the north and the south. So we're talking about North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, <clears throat> then later on becomes a state, um, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, the southern and western parts of Tennessee, and then Missouri as well later on. All these states become known as the South. And the South is broken, broken up into a couple of different uh, regions. Um, there's the northern, the upper south, and then the lower south, and then there's the deep south. So the upper south will be what I'm talking about, the borderland states, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina. This, this will be the upper south. The lower south will begin with South Carolina, uh, and then go down with Georgia, Florida. The deep south will be Mississippi, Alabama. Those, those two are, and to this day, they still have like that connotation or that uh, characteristic of being of the, the South, and the Deep South, right? uh, Alabama, Georgia, I mean, I'm sorry, <clears throat> Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, those three things, those three, three states. Uh, so this chapter uh, from 1800 to 1860 is a peculiar institution. Uh, It's peculiar because it's a different way of it doing economy, of doing uh, business. In the north, industrialization is taking off. And the, the industrial revolution really takes off in the north. It's really, really, really interesting. How in the south, that really doesn't become part of the, of the economy. What actually happens, in fact, is that the south, the textile industry, so the, the industrial revolution was... Is the machine, the core of the industrial revolution, was run by textile companies, by textile factories, factories first of all in England, uh, Manchester, England, uh, Liverpool, and these were textile uh, <clears throat> factories. 
or they would get raw cotton and turn it into cloth, whether it be a shirt or whatever made out of cotton. Uh, this was the basis, right? The Eli Whitney, we talked about this in the last chapter, Eli Whitney being the one that invented uh, the gin, the processing cotton gin, making uh, disentangling uh, the seeds from the cotton and thus making it much easier to produce cotton. <clears throat> so what's going, to what's going to happen in this time period is that by 1800, by 1820, uh, you have the South providing all the raw material, i.e., in essence, the cotton, to these textile factories up north in Massachusetts, in Lowell, right, in Kentucky, right, and all these big industrializing cities. So they're dependent on each other, the South and the North. Uh, for um, a lot of, uh, for some reason, kind of like the mainstream kind of idea is that the South kind of creates its own independent kind of trajectory and the North does its own thing as well. But what's going on in fact here is that both economies are feeding each other. You have cotton being produced, the raw materials being produced by who? By slaves, right? Mostly. Uh, and then this raw material is being shipped out to the North where it's being produced from raw material to textiles in these factories. So without the cotton, these factories would not work, right? So that's, they're dependent. And without the factories, uh, you wouldn't need the demand for cotton. <clears throat> so there's a big interdependence here between the North and the South, their economies, how they work. One is agricultural base, plantation base, uh, the raw material produces, provides the raw material about cotton, and then the North uh, turns that cotton, manufactures that cotton in a factory, manufactures into shirts, finished product, and then you ship it out or you just sell it in the market. So it's this whole integrated economy that's going on here. Uh, <clears throat> so get that straight, that uh, both the North and the South, as, they, as the North industrializes, the plantations are also growing because more factories are being produced, more industry, more raw material needed for these industries, for these factories. And I'm going this way because we're going westward now. Right? We just have the Louisiana Purchase. So we need on the land, right? We're moving that way. We're going that way towards, um, <clears throat> we're, we're going towards the Spanish Empire. And then later on in 1821, towards Mexico, um, it's spreading slavery. All towards that south, southern band. <clears throat> so, and this kind of <clears throat> Time period 1800 to 1860, basically at the turn of the century, got 1800. By that, we're totally a slave society. So there's a big distinction, or some scholars, right, and you could argue against this, uh, saying that we've always been a slave society. But some scholars like to argue that when the American Revolution first started, that we were a society with slaves. That is, that our economy did not depend on slavery for its success. Or our notion of freedom was not dependent on slavery. We, were just, we just needed slaves to help us here and there. It was property rights, right? actually land, that was the main thing. Slaves are property, and that's gonna kind of shift from land to more like human, human property. Chateau property. So we have a shift here from society with slaves to society that's not really dependent on slavery for its success to, oh man, why is that? 
a slave society. A society that's now its basis for the economy, whether it's north or the south, is slavery. Alright, so now we have this shift here going up. Now we're fully on a slave society. All the way from Delaware to like Texas, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> In Texas, uh, I guess we'll wait for the next chapter uh, to talk about Texas. So. That's a whole conundrum that happens there. Basically, the Texas independence uh, was because of slavery. But let's not let's not jump let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's just go a little bit bigger here. So from Delaware to Texas, we have this peculiar institution. Basically, we have, we're, a, we're a slave society now. Um, by 1860, by the end of this era that we're talking about here, there were about four million enslaved Americans. Four million people that were slaves. This was worth about three billion dollars. Uh, equivalent about 19 percent 20 percent of the wealth of the entire nation right so 20 percent of the nation's wealth is based on just the property alone just the, the owning them not what they produce not the surplus value just the, the value of the slaves right so four million people i don't know how many we're good at math just divide right how many each each person was worth a couple thousand <clears throat> it's 20% of just that, just the property itself, just the property of slaves, right? Just the human property, not the production of them, it's a surplus value, which then will be a whole nother percentage, much bigger percentage. So basically, your, your, the basis of your whole economy is on slavery. All right, and I'm just giving you this this illustration here, the $3 billion, the 20% of the wealth of the nation on just owning humans, not what they produce, right? That's much bigger. Uh, don't get me wrong, we're not the only slave society. It's not the U.S. Uh, it's not peculiar to the U.S. Uh, Brazil was also one of the big, perhaps the biggest slave societies in this side of the continent. Right, slavery has always been a thing. It's never been. There's nothing new here. We never. We we not. We did not invent the wheel here with slavery. Uh, Native Americans have done slavery for millennia. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, even after slavery was abolished in the U.S., Indian slavery, but the so-called other slavery, that continued for a while. Uh, it's a really, really good book with that. Too. Just came out kind of recently, uh, 2016, so about three, four years ago, four years ago already, uh, by Andres Resendez. This guy's a Mexican scholar. He's a professor at the University of California, UC Davis. You know, a picture of him, you can see. There's people uh, So he wrote this book. Uh, he, he wrote, at least he, he won a couple of uh, awards. He won the Bancroft Prize, and this is basically the, if you're a historian, this is the, the price you want to get. Right? It's like the Nobel Prize for literature, but for historians, it's the Bancroft. It's this guy, James Bancroft, that was a famous historian back in the day. But basically, if you, if you win the Bancroft, Bancroft Prize, you're, you're pretty much a shit, right? It's a really good book, and it's called The Other Slavery, and it's all about that. It's about Indian slavery. And how when we think about slavery, right, this whole chapter is all about slavery. But it's all they've worked about African American slavery or African slavery. Uh, most scholars, when, when you see the word slavery, you think about, you know, um, Africans in, in ships, in chains, right, being transported from Africa across the Atlantic and into Virginia or into the plantations over here. And what, what gets also, what gets lost is Indian slavery. Right? It's Native Americans that were doing enslaving uh, before the U.S. was even a country and stuff. So I really recommend I mean, to take a look at this book, um, The Other Slavery. Um, I think you have, what is it, Red Shelf? That 
or you, get, you can rent books for free for a while. You're gonna definitely find this there, uh, The Other Slavery. It's a really famous book, pretty easy to read. Uh, and this one kind of covers the entire Western Hemisphere. So I really, really recommend this book if you're talking about slavery in your uh, essay, for example. So I'm gonna send this, The Other Slavery. I know it's upside down, but I guess, I don't know. So it's a really, really good book. <clears throat> um, so yeah. Um, so this chapter begins with Frederick Douglass. Let's, let's go into the, the textbook now. It's kind of like just an overview of slavery, or what it is, or how it kind of works out. <clears throat> So yeah, Frederick Douglass, uh, and I guess Frederick Douglass is a really good uh, embodiment of the story of slavery. So he was born a slave uh, from a white master, a slave, enslaved woman, uh, and then he escapes the South. Uh, he runs away. Uh, he gets fake papers from a friend who is a free black person, and he uh, pretends to be this other person, and he gets through. Luckily, right? One of the main things that uh, makes him able to do that, to blend in as a free person, is that he's able, to, he's able to read and write. He's literate. So when he was younger, when he was enslaved, one of his masters, he was sold a couple of times. It's totally natural, totally normal. If you're a slave, to be just be sold and have different masters and just lose your family across the time. Right? Because people don't not see you as humans with family families and stuff you're just property you know? so when what would happen sometimes a lot or a lot of times what would happen is that when a slave master would go bankrupt <clears throat> or be on hard times um, they would start selling their slaves right no fucks given with whether they had were they were a father or a sister or whatever right so <clears throat> we'll, go, we'll talk about that more in a little bit yeah, so Frederick Douglass, he was literate, was able to escape, and you know him, right? he became one of the most famous abolitionists. And an abolitionist is that like you want to abolish slavery, you want to get rid of slavery. Right? And talking about uh, this book about the other slavery, he makes a good point about there's no abol abolitionist for Indian slavery. Nobody was going out of their way, writing pamphlets and doing uh, research like Frederick Douglass was and these other abolitionists in the North. To get rid of African American slavery, to get rid of Indian slavery, the same thing. There was no abolition of abolitionist movement for this, even though it was like an open secret. Everybody knew this was happening. And some argue that, or he argues actually, it's a pretty good argument, I think. Andres Resendez, that the the modern slave trade, the sex trade, sex trafficking, right, is kind of based off this other slavery. This because over here with the Indians, the main commodity, the main slave that was exchanged as property for women, uh, Indian women, as slaves. Whereas over here in the plantations, in the, in the U.S., uh, South and Deep South, women were also had a high premium. And we're explaining that right now why. But you also wanted strong men to work these fields. Over here, you didn't have these massive plantation fields, right? Over here, with the in the west, the southwest. Uh, but you had, you know, these conquistadors, right? Starts with them that just wanted gratification, sexual gratification, stuff like that. So, really, really good book. Really, really good book. I really recommend this book. The other slavery. Um. <clears throat> So, right at the eve of the Civil War, 4 million slaves, $3 billion, 20% of the wealth of the nation. Very important institution. Peculiar, but important for the whole nation. Okay. Um, so, it was not just the South. Right? The Southern thing. Um, although, I must say, in the South, as a whole, the whole Southern states, one third of the whole population was slaves. Right, and then think about the Constitution. 
the three three fifths uh, clause. This, this kind of gives you uh, an idea that Saturn. That's why, you, for the first couple of generations of the U.S., first what was it? The first twenty years, I think. All U.S. presidents were Southern, were from the South, except for John Adams. Right. So John Adams was from New England, but afterwards there were a bunch of Southerners. All right, so cotton is the main staple, right? So you think about slavery at this time period, 1800, 1860 is cotton, right? So by this time period, rice, uh, tobacco is doing bad. It's not profitable no more. So people are turning to cotton. Some people outside, fucking racing. Um, and cotton becomes the main thing because of these textiles industries in the north and in England. And so you put, cotton becomes the most um, in demand. Who the fuck is? Uh, globally in demand is cotton. Uh, to it's, it's, it's what's running the it's what's running the industrial revolution. It's cotton, <laughs> slaves. Okay. Uh, mm. It replaces sugar as a main plantation. Um, and here I, I kind of want to make the variations between plantation slaveries. Right. So there's rice. Right. There's tobacco. That kind of dies out by 1800. Replaced by cotton. Then you still have rice. So you have uh, the rice kingdoms from Carolinas now competing with these emerging cotton kingdoms from the rest of the South, right? So before this time period, before cotton becomes uh, mass produced because of Eli Whitney's cotton gin invention, it was uh, the rice uh, plantations that were the most profitable. It was the people in Carolinas, the plantation owners in Carolinas that were the, the richest ones. Now is these now that cotton becomes really easy to grow and to produce. Uh, now you have these emerging cotton kings kingdoms. Right? So cotton is king. That's what the phrase is from. <clears throat> and it's all because of this textile manufacturing in the north. You need these factories that are producing cloth. They need what I'm saying. They need cotton. So you gotta mass produce cotton because there's a lot of demand for it. So let's get slaves to produce cotton. Um, something I gotta mention here uh, is the Abolition Act of 1818, 1808. The Abolition Act of 1808. So in 1808, we have the Abolition Act, or also called the Slave Trade Act. And this pretty much uh, outlawed and banned foreign slavery. The transatlantic slave trade was outlawed in 1808. You couldn't buy slaves. You couldn't import slaves and buy them from across the Atlantic. Okay. <laughs> so this kind of this is kind of I'm kind of laughing because between 1820 um, or um, what is it? Is it on this book here? It's on this book. It's this other book here. Between 1800 and 1808, right before the law was going to be passed, <laughs> this form, because we knew this was going to be passed, it was part of the U.S. Constitution. I think they gave us like 20 years. It was part of the compromises. When we drafted the U.S. Constitution, it was like, we're going to, we were going to outlaw. Some people wanted to outlaw slavery already since the beginning of the nation. And the Southerners were like, no, we need this. So there was, I think, 20 years, right? Uh, like a charter, 20 years. And that would be in 1808. Right, so people knew that this law was going to go into effect. So by 1800 and 1808, these eight years before this uh, Abolition Act went, to, went into effect, uh, slave traffickers delivered to Southern planters at least 40,000 Africans <laughs> to American planters, right? So we knew we were gonna, uh, we we're gonna be outlawed. This transatlantic slave system was gonna be outlawed. So 
we pushed up, right? We pushed up uh, the importation for these eight years. Right? Um, however, we didn't, planters at this time period now, by 1808, by 1800, basically, we were not dependent, right? If we were a planter, a plantation owner, we were not dependent on the transatlantic slave system no more. There was a thing called the domestic slave trade. Uh, also called the Second Middle Passage. Um, so the domestic slave trade is that, you know, there's just naturally increase. Natural production, reproduction of slaves was a thing. There was a, in Virginia, the first state to do this, they passed a law where the, the offsprings of slaves by a white person, by a white man, would be based on the matric, on the matrilineal, matrilineal base on the mother. Before this law, it was custom, it's custom law, that if a white master raped a slave woman and they had a child, that child would get the rights of a father. It was patrilineal, and the, the rights, how you get endowed rights, birth rights, the birth rights of a citizen. By 1800, I forgot the exact date, but by 1800, this changed. By 1820, by the mid, by early 1800s, um, this thing changed. There was laws put into place where the offspring of such unions between the white father and the enslaved woman, now it was based. The birth rights were based on the woman. So now the the offsprings were now slaves by birth. This is really, really important. This was actually on purpose to keep slavery alive because it was totally necessary to maintain slavery, to maintain production of cotton and these other raw materials like rice. And or well, indigo, not so much either no more. But it was rice and cotton that really were the, the, the main stable crops. Really cotton was the main thing. So the domestic slave trade, right? natural reproduction. So we create these laws. So now, I mean, this, 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 there's no really clear evidence that this happened, right? These that we call like these factories, right? these slave factories. Um, kind of, there kind of is, there kind of not. Um, there's oral histories that allude to this happening, that white owners, right, that white men basically would buy women on purpose to rape them, to impregnate them, to impregnate them, to get more slaves. Because now they're slaves after this, after 1800, basically, 1808. Because now you can't buy slaves from Africa, so how are you gonna get slaves now? So this domestic slave trade began. Right? This is one of the ways that uh, we did not need slaves from Africa no more by natural reproduction, right? So if you buy a woman, a slave woman, you rape her, basically, you get her pregnant, and those kids, now they're slaves. Right? So that's one way that this second middle passage happened. Another way is that um, from these older plantation states that were about doing, that were producing, like in Virginia, producing tobacco and now the soil was overused that's one of the reasons why tobacco went in decline was because the soil erosion so people in virginia had to move for better soil so now we have the louisiana purchase that opened up this whole tract of land fertile land was that oh as well too a lot of little rivers throughout the whole land throughout the whole south um so they moved and this is a great a big migration, right? And they moved with their slaves. And this is the second middle passage. It's internal, it's domestic, right? From these older plantations in Virginia and the upper uh, slave states to the deep south. So about two million slaves or more, right? Became known as the second middle passage. They were transported or traded across uh, states. Uh, and then this happened, and then it continued on into Texas, this whole. Right, so you go from the older slave states 
these old plantations in Virginia, up there towards the northern parts, the eastern seaboard, into the deep south. This is the second middle passage. <clears throat> so, yeah. I have, I have these notes here that I should really take a look at. Just give me that. This is the second little passage. Um, all right. So we have slavery in the nation is the next little section that we have going on here. Again, the North was totally integrated into the slave, into this peculiar institution. So it was not really peculiar, right? It was not just the South that was dealing with slavery or benefiting from the fruits of black labor, unpaid labor, forced labor, slavery. The North also benefited. The North was not immune to slavery. Uh, slavery pretty much shaped everybody's lives, whether you were a Southerner or a Northerner. So how did this shape Northerners' life? You were from New York to Boston, right? You, had, you guys had ended slavery already. Right? You prided yourself, right, that you were the, from the North. You were more humane. You were more above, more civilized than your brethren in the South because you didn't believe in slavery. Yet here you are wearing expensive clothes that is made out of cotton, right, or an expensive hat. Right, you're from the, from the north, and you want to show off your fashion, right? Or all these women, right, with their fashionable clothing from, from the north, saying that, oh no, slavery doesn't not affect me, yet they're wearing the same clothing. This is exactly what's going on today, too. And right? this hasn't changed at all. Right? This, this system of capital, how it's, it's production and surplus value. Right? We need cheap labor. It's all about cheap labor and how to get more surplus value from that person producing something, okay? This is economics now. Right? It's gonna turn to a class of economics because this is pretty important. So you have a person, whether they're a slave or not, you have a person. The way to make money in the easiest way is to pay them less, okay? That's why uh, you see a lot of uh, outsourcing in today's world, where you go to, you have a factory producing jeans, Go to Juarez, the maquiladora, right? Or you go even southern, deeper to the south, Puebla, and you pay less and less, right? Because different um, laws, uh, different wages, right? So over here in the U.S., the minimum wage is what, 750, 725 an hour, the federal minimum wage. Uh, in Mexico, it's, I think that's, if that's a week. So over the here you get seven twenty five an hour. Over there it's seven twenty five or so. I think it's eight dollars a week. I think it's even more now because of this AMLO guy, this new president. I think it's like twelve dollars a week. It's a week though. <laughs> a totally different way paying wages. So if you're an owner of a factory, right, you just move, right? just move your plantation, where you get cheap labor. So over here in the border states, you know, there's they might turn into free states. So move into the south. To Mississippi, Alabama, not only is there better soil, but now you have cheap labor, right? So I mean, Tesla's gonna. Oh, man, I mean, I, I read in the El Paso Inc. newspaper that Tesla is thinking about opening up a factory here in El Paso. It's because of that. It's cheap labor, right? You don't have to pay your workers as much as you pay them in California. You pay them here the minimum wage, seven twenty-five. This is what you get paid here in El Paso, right? This is what's going on here. Right? Um, think of, look at your shirts, where, where they're made out of, made in China. Right? You think they're getting paid for wages over there? Right? This, this is the same thing that's going on over here right now in the 1800s in these plantations. Right? You have this abundance of cheap labor, slavery, and you can make all this profit. Right? And these northerners are also being shaped by this, right? the way they dress, the way they, they benefit from slavery. One way or another, right? It's, they did not, man, not they might not see a slave every day. They might not whip them, but what they're wearing, the way their their life is shaped, is because of slavery. Right? <clears throat> uh, right. 
here, for example, not just regular people, slavery and the institution itself had this big economic structure. Right, you have ships, right? Not just transporting cotton back and forth, but what would happen here is that you will send cotton that was made by the slaves to Boston, right, to the factories in Boston in the north, in New Jersey, in New York. And then over there in the same ship, you'll they'll bring back many manufactured goods. Um, you know, shirts, right? Uh, whatever, right? Stuff that was already done, right? Because the North already had the industry, the machines to create finished goods, furniture, chairs, whatever, you know, everything, machinery. And then over here, we'll just bring the raw material. So you're shipping the raw material up North and you're bringing down South the finished goods. So what's going on? So what we have here is this growing interdependence between the lords of the loom and these are the owners of the factories, right? the loom factories, the textile factories, and then the lords of the lash, slave owners. So you have these people in the South. recording yeah still okay well okay damn god damn backwards so the loom the lash All right um textile factories cotton producers they need each other the same um economic system basically the the nation right this is the way it's tied by slavery all right. Uh, let's talk about different classes in the South. So let's talk about the South now itself. Um, the Southern economy. There were very few cities, large cities in the South. New Orleans was the biggest one. Mm, you had Charleston in South Carolina. Uh, Basically, that's kind of it. Yeah. You didn't have much large cities. It was basically just all agricultural, plantation-based. Um, New Orleans was, still is a shit. It's fucking cool to go there. You yeah, have the time. It's just, it's got a lot of heritage. Not just uh, Spanish, but French, Caribbean, Creole. And then you have these, these the Gullah people speaking Gullah languages. It's just, it's a, it's, a, it's a metropolitan area. And it's mostly, most, most tied, it's, it's mostly integrated to the Caribbean economy and stuff. So New Orleans is the only big city over here. Uh, the whole region, the South, only produce about 10% of manufactured goods, so finished products. So again, the South was all about produ producing the raw material, producing cotton. Mm, um, so let's talk about the actual people in the South. Right? So not all, the, not all the people in the South, or not all white people in the South owned slaves. Um, <clears throat> only one fourth really owned a substantial number of slaves. There was only a small number that were the large plantation owners that owned a lot of slaves. So not everybody owned slaves in the South. But most everybody in the South was on par, was in favor of the institution of slavery. Okay. <clears throat> so you have kind of like two main classes, two main kind of groups of people in the South. 
you have like the, the plain folk, everyday white people, and then the planter class, the wealthy elite slave owners. So uh, the white plain folk of the old South, um, they were like these yeoman farmers. They worked their own land, small plots of land, and they were self-sustainable, basically. Um, they, uh, the thing that did tie them to this planter class was racism, right? this notion that just that white people were just naturally, biologically superior than any other people of color. Um, politics, you know, everybody was able to vote if you were white. And the, uh, property qualification was not a thing no more. So that also created a common identity between the lower class whites that didn't have slaves and the ones that did have slaves. Um, and then with jobs, you know, these, uh, when the slaves would run away, run away and try to escape, the patrols that would go after them were these poor white men and the jobs, look at jobs, but, you know, so there was this identity, even though there was different classes, there was this identity of being white that kind of combined them together, this racism, you know, kind of justified them to go along with slavery. Another thing is that slavery was seen as a basis of freedom for these white people, whether you were poor or a slave owner. If you had property in the form of human bondage, then you were seen as having uh, more freedom. Uh, <clears throat> so fewer than 2,000 families own 100 slaves or more. Oh, these are the super wealthy planter. Right. Um, but owning, right, basically, if you didn't care, it doesn't matter if you own 100 or you own one or two slaves, owning slaves was seen or was actually through, towards wealth, towards being a wealthy person in the South. Owning slaves was the route to wealth, status, influence. So give me, give me some figures here. The, uh, in 1840, the cost of a slave of a prime field hand was about 1800, so about $1,800. By 1860, um, I'm sorry, let me turn that back. In 1840, it was $1,000, one grand, one K. In 1860, 20 years afterwards, right before the Civil War, it had almost doubled by to 1800, 1,800, which in today's uh, money be about $40,000. So it was a pretty heavy investment. $40,000 buy you a person. Right, but that was the, the, the way to, to, to wealth. Now you had an extra hand to produce more. And you can make more money and make more money and make more money like that. Um, so this kind of gets me to the idea of paternalism. So even though it was a terrible institution, you had absolutely no freedom. Uh, one way that white people would justify slavery in this time period, especially white southerners, was this notion of a paternalism. And Think about this, right? This this worth a lot of money. Like this person, this slave. You don't want to just treat them so bad that they run away, or you don't want to treat them so bad that they're useless, right? You don't want to chop off their hands or do something so bad where they're not producible, right? They don't, they're not productive, right? You want to invest. It's like it's forty grand. Like in today's money, it's about forty grand. How much a slave would cost? That's like a really good car. You know, I mean, you're not gonna just like treat it like crap, right? So this is like the idea of paternalism, that we were like they were better off. These people, these African Americans, they were kind of better off being slaves because they're taken care of by this paternal, right? And paternalism comes from the Latin word of pater, that means father, by this father figure, which is like the white owner, the white plantation owner, and right? he's gonna house them, 
He's going to feed them. Right? Minimal housing, minimal feed. But they have that. Right? As a matter of fact, one of the pro-slavery arguments, right, one of the arguments for slavery was that slaves in the South are doing better than workers that are free in the North, that work in factories. Right? These mill workers, these uh, girls. Right? These people work in terrible conditions, just like slaves in the South, and they get paid terrible wages, right? and they have to pay for their own food, for their own apartments, right? for their own everything. And at the end of the day, at some, argue, some people would argue this, that slaves were way better, were doing better, were far better than the worker, the free worker up in the North. So slavery is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. We're taking care of these people. Um, one of the books, one, one book that kind of uses this argument, kind of, is this book here by Stanley Elkins, Slavery, first published in 1954. So what's going on in 1954, right? We have all these, the civil rights right movement is about to explode, right? You have uh, all these uh, Supreme Court decisions about integrating uh, schools, right? And this guy is talking about like how slavery was kind of a good thing because slaves have like two kind of characteristics or sambos, they're just brutes, very, very violent, or they're like childlike and you have to like take care of them. Right? So this is the idea of paternalism that slavery, that slave owners would use as a justification for slavery. That we're actually taking care of these people. Just like your family. It's like a pet. It's like buying an expensive dog. Right? An expensive pet. It's like buying like a tiger, I guess. Right? Talking about, you know, carol baskets and shit here. Um, so yeah. So then and this was people bought this up, right? This justification. Right. And think about it, like in, in brute terms, it does make sense. The northerner, free wage laborer that was paid by the hour didn't do so well, you know, as, you know, you know, the, the, the guy, I forgot his name, I think it's John Calhoun, who made that argument that, you know what, like slaves in the South have it good, have it better than the poor wager in the North that has to work and toil in the factories. Slavery is a good thing. So that was one of the pro, our pro slavery arguments. Uh, and this is based upon this paternalism that we take care of these people. Uh, so, John Cahoon is one of the main proponents of these. Uh, you heard about this guy before. Uh, racism is another argument they would use, right? Just, just a biological fact. It's a God given fact that white people are just better than the rest. Uh, the Bible was another uh, source for arguing for the justification of slavery. So there is uh, basically uh, that you need to uh, obey your master. So just the slave needs to obey their planter, their slave owner. Uh, I think Abraham also had some slaves and stuff like that. So they will use um, one of the primary sources for this chapter. Talks about that, about how, about actually using the Bible. Actually, what's cool about the, the, this chapter's uh, primary sources is that one of them uses the Bible against slavery, and one, the other one uses the Bible for slavery. So, you can use the Bible for many things. Right? Very adaptable little book. <clears throat> so, the, there are some different, different arguments for the addition of slavery that people thought were super valid. Um, one of the big arguments was, again, that without slavery, white people are not free. That slavery is a basis for freedom. For white people. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so, abolition of the Americas. Hmm. Um, 
between 1800 and 1840, 1860 basically, this, this whole time period that we're talking about in this chapter, up, up, up to the rest of the semester, uh, there was a whole wave of abolition uh, across the Americas and in the Old World in Britain. For example, Britain in 1838 abolished slavery completely. You couldn't own slaves at all. Um, 1821, Mexico, as it got in its independence, abolished slavery as well. This is the beginning. So a lot of slaves would run away to Mexico, especially from Texas, into Mexico. So there's this gradual movement of emancipation. And it was just kind of like the the spirit of the time, the side guys. But the southern, the southern United States was holding on to it. That was the exception. The other exception was Brazil, another big uh, slave society whose economy was dependent on slaves. But Brazil was all about sugar, whereas over here in the U.S. was all about cotton. So slave, um, so in 1838, Britain, Britain abolished the slavery. However, it compensated slave owners. It gave about, in total, about 20 million pounds, which would be double muscle metal, so about $40 million distributed across to different slave owners as compensation for their loss of property. It's pro their property. They're not humans, they're property. Um, so by 1840, slavery had been outlawed in Mexico, all of Central America, in Chile, and gradual emancipation was already in place in Venezuela, Colombia, and Peru. So all of like the Western Hemisphere was already emancipating their slaves, except for America. America was still holding on tightly, and will hold on tightly to a bloody end, basically, slavery. Uh, Brazil didn't abolish slavery until 1888. But Brazil was the last one to abolish slavery in the Western Hemisphere. <clears throat> so, yeah, and what was why? It's because it was just seen as backwards now. Uh, you have this guy, Adam Smith. I think I've talked about this guy before. He wrote a really important book called The Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations is the foundational book of capitalism. And in this foundational book of capitalism, this is the foundation of capitalism. This is what gives our modern economy its theory. What Adam Smith? Anyways, uh, the wealth of nations. In this book, he himself says that slavery is just as outdated, and it's not profitable. What's more profitable is wage labor, free wage labor. And this is what, kind of what we have now. So we're seeing this whole enlightenment movement, and this whole people are just seeing this as uncivilized. This is a thing of the past. It's a relic. Southerners, on the other hand, were like, uh, not really, though. Like, think about progress. Now, you guys are talking about progress, human progress, civilization. And Southerners, a lot of Southerners were like, well, think about like the Roman Empire and the Greeks. They did some amazing human endeavors and accomplishments and those were slave societies their societies were based on slaves so there was this big debate between at least in the u.s that slavery was a good or a bad thing okay. <clears throat> right uh there was this one journalist in the richmond inquirer this is in uh, richmond virginia and this is what it says quote unquote freedom is not possible without slavery. <laughs> so under the law, nonetheless, slavery, slaves were a property. 
Um, most slaves had very, very few rights. For example, one of the very few rights the slaves did have was that it was illegal to kill a slave without any, without self-defense, without provocation, uh, or give them serious uh, injury without provocation. But besides that, you could do whatever the heck you wanted with a slave. Um, by the 1830s, as a matter of fact, it was illegal to teach slaves how to read and write all throughout the South. This was not enforced rigorously, it depended on the slave owner, but it was technically illegal to teach your slave how to read and write by the 1830s. Right, this is a response to the Haitian Revolution, to all these insurrections going on. <clears throat> not just in, in Haiti, but in Jamaica, there was also a big insurrection of where about 20,000 slaves revolted. It was brutally suppressed. Not successful like Haiti. But nonetheless, a lot of these things are going around, right? This, this spirit is going around of freedom, liberty, basically. What's going on here? <clears throat> and this is all based on the language of the Declaration of Independence, right? All men are created equal, right? These slaves are totally eating this up, right? And this whole enlightenment movement of freedom and the individuals, and individualism and stuff like that. John Calhoun, as a matter of fact, said that those led, that the Declaration of Independence was a political mistake. It was wrong. It was the most dangerous mistake we've done politically was to write the Declaration of Independence because of those words that all men are created equal. And this is John, John Calhoun, who was like the most Powerful, most influential southern politician. <clears throat> um, all right. Uh, let's see. So, very little rights. Uh, masters, we pretty much controlled everything about you, even your intimate life, who you married, right? who you had kids with. Uh, they really couldn't like enforce that, but they could separate you. So the threat of separation, the threat of sale, was very real for slaves. So that's one way to keep slaves at bay, to keep them controlled. Well, you could just threaten them to sell them, and then you're going to sever all their relations, all their kinships that they had made. Right. Um, this is a really interesting case. Celia, the slave, this woman, the slave. So she killed her white uh, slave owner, her master, because she was being raped by this guy. She killed him. And she, they actually, she goes to court. They actually gave her her day of court. However, the, the magistrate, the judge, rules against her. Right? That's not self-defense. Uh, because she's not, she's property. <laughs> so if it was a white woman, right, then yes. The self-defense would apply to that case, but since she's a slave, right? She's a black woman. She's a slave. You cannot claim self-defense because you're property. So, yeah. So uh, she she lost that case. Uh, she was charged with murder, <laughs> and she was sentenced to die. But because she was, sent, they didn't kill her right away. They didn't hang her right away. They waited. They delayed her execution until she gave birth. Because if you kill her when she's pregnant, you're going to lose a slave. <laughs> so they waited for her to give birth so they could have a slave. And then they killed her. And then they murdered her. For, for, they executed her for murder. So Celia. <sighs> Fucking fucked up. Huh? So conditions of a slave were fucked. Right? Um... And there's different variations of slave of sla a slave life, uh, slave in, in slavery. Uh, there's regional differences, right? So in the Chesapeake area, the tobacco, or was formerly the tobacco area, uh, you had a more diversified economy, where these slaves were actually craftsmen. Uh, the cultivation of corn and wheat became the main thing. 
in the Chesapeake area. It's from Virginia. What used to be tobacco. Uh, so the milling, the flour, right? Grind, grinding the wheat into flour. That's what the slaves out there would do. And then in the lower south, this is like in Georgia, South Carolina, you see uh, indigo is the main thing. And, and rice. Uh, and rice was mostly just in the coastal areas, the low country of South Carolina. So you have indigo and rice in the lower south. And then in the deep south, you have cotton, and then you have sugar in New Orleans, Louisiana, that bayou area. And sugar plantation was by far the worst type of job because just the way the crop is. So you have variations of slave uh, economies and slave production and slave conditions based on the crop that they're growing. So if, you grow, if you're in the in your sugar plantation, you're fucked. Because it takes about the the seasons of, of sugar, they overlap. I think it takes about 13 months or 14 months for sugar to, to grow into a mature and then cut it down. And as soon as you cut down the sugar cane, you have to process it into sugar real quick or it, was, or it goes bad. So it's really intensive labor all year round. There's no breaks in sugar cutting, basically. Uh, the, the second least extent, in, intensive uh, type of um, slave is the cotton. Yeah. Cotton also has a long season, but it's not, it doesn't overlap, right? There's a time period where you just pick the cotton and but it's, but it's work all year long, right? <clears throat> and then, uh, and I guess rice, I guess indigo and then rice. The rice plantations, you had the most economy as a slave because it was full of malaria. These people, the swamp in these coastal areas in South Carolina were fucking full of malaria. The white people were terrified to go to their own plantations. So you had these absentee plantation owners. They would live in the Caribbean, somewhere in, Berm in Bermuda, or somewhere in the Barbados, or in Dominique. So in Britain, they would live in London, and they would come every year once in a while, or they would send a cousin to oversee the plantations to make sure it's being run well. But for the most part, you know, it was, so there was more autonomy in the rice plantations, and then much less autonomy when you had cotton. And then cotton doesn't grow as big as the sugar or as any other plant like tobacco. It's kind of, it's kind of a short plant. You know, have you ever seen cotton out here in the Philippines or here in El Paso? You know what I'm talking about. It's a short plant. So it's very easy to oversee people. So you're, they were on you, on your ass all the time in the cotton plantation. So the sugar plantation, the cotton plantations were the worst conditions to work at. <clears throat> I don't know why Dr. Fauner here compares with Brazil. I guess because it's another slave society. But there, they never uh, outlawed the transatlantic slave trade. So they never cared how much, how they treated the slaves. Uh, so they always brought slaves back and forth from, I mean, from Africa. So the slaves over here in the US, they'd eat better, they slept better. They had better conditions, working conditions than the ones in Brazil. Just because that, because they they didn't outlaw the transatlantic slave trade. They, they just if the slave got, got killed or they lost their arm, fuck them, get them their slave. But we here you have to take care of your slaves a little bit, because they were pretty pricey commodity, right? You couldn't just get one from Africa. Um. Nonetheless, uh, a smart slave owner would treat their slaves right, would give them rights, and will give them, you know, would enough food, and a nice house, not a nice house, but a good place to sleep, I guess, right? Because you want them content, you don't want them to rebel, and you want them productive. So a smart slave owner would, you know, give some, 
you know, that paternal idea. You're a good father. Stern, where you have to be disciplined, but you provide. Right? So that's one uh, an argument. And this guy, this book here, called Roe, Jordan Roe, Eugene Genovese. Pretty thick book. Really, really good book, though. And it's all about the conditions of slavery, about how, about the lives of slaves. It's called The World the Slaves Made. And it's, it's really, really good. It talks, about, it talks about everything about that. And he goes at length about the economics. He takes a really economic lens at slavery. He's a Marxist scholar. So he takes a, an, an economic view at slavery and talks about that at length, about paternalism, about how slave owners here in the U.S. needed to, you know, they needed to kind of take care of the slaves somehow because if they wanted to make a profit. It's kind of like if you have like a race car, like a really expensive race car. Right? If you don't treat it good and right, you're going to lose races. But if you maintain it, change the oil and everything, it's gonna, you're going to you know, keep doing well. Right? Same thing, it's a property. Basic. The slaves were property back then. They were quite investment. Not everybody was able to afford slaves. All right. Um, let's talk about slave culture, the slave family. So even though it was technically illegal to have families, that nonetheless happened with slaves. And again, this is one of the things that slave owners would use, the threat of sale to maintain order and productivity. But there was ways that slaves would uh, resist and create their own little world, right? the, the world that slaves made. Right? They were not just uh, property. They actually were a active agents that created their own lives. Um, <clears throat> first of all, let's not forget, there was also free uh, black people in this, in this time period as well in the South. Not that many, but there were, there were some free black people, mostly craftsmen. And people had bought their way out. Um, and there was two main institutions in, fam in the slave culture. Family and church. Those are the two main things that made slave life bearable, basically. You were a slave. Your family, and this doesn't have to be your immediate family. right? This, this is the notion of extended families. Right, so we we were a slave, and you were a young slave, or you were like twenty one, you know, sixteen, whatever. You're a prime of your life, you were a prime field hand. Right? You're gonna be you're gonna be sold, for sure. And you're gonna be separated from your family when you come from the ship, from your original, direct, immediate family. So when you get to a new plantation, you're gonna make a family. Right, you're gonna get adopted, basically. Right, right? an uncle. Or an auntie, they're not really your real blood un uncle or your blood aunt, but this is like kind of like the the the, the role they take, right? You get adopted into this extended kinship ties, right? That goes not that extend across plantations, not just in one plantation, but a couple plantations. And it's like, oh yeah, my my uncle, you know, my uncle Bob, he works at the plantation with the Smiths. Oh, you know Bob. Oh man. Oh yeah, yeah. So then you make kinships, you make relationships out of basic survival, right? And with these kinships and networks that will be made, right? It's not bloodlines, it's just networking. You'll know, you'll get news, right? You'll be like, yeah, the Smiths, the, that's those plantation owners, they're brutal, man. If you land with them, you're fucked. Or actually, or go with the go with the Morgans. Those people are pretty cool. You know, if you do your job, you know, they'll, they'll treat you right, you know? So you'll, you'll learn about this stuff and these kinship ties and these kinship networks. And they were informal, and they were not like bloodline, but they were necessary survival. Right? So this family, right, quote unquote family, this institution, this networking, was essential for slaves to make life bearable. The next thing was church, religion. Uh, look at the study of the Exodus. Right? Uh, the slaves that get, I, I'm not really good with the Bible stories, but the, the slave uh, in Egypt, right? they need to go, they go across Egypt and they get, you know, you guys, I'm, I'm sure y'all know the story better than I do. Um, 
of the exodus. And they identified as that, right? As looking for the promised land, like the slaves, identified with the with the slaves from the Bible. I really should know more about this. I should, I should read the Bible again. I read this when I was a kid, and I read it unwillingly, so that I just went in one ear and out the other. And I do have the Bible at home here, but I need to reread it. But yeah, this idea of the, the story of the Exodus right, was a big story for the slaves. Um, that's why uh, Bob Marley, anybody big fan of Bob Marley here? One of his uh, albums is called Exodus. One of his really good songs is called Exodus. And it's about that. It's Jamaican slaves trying to find lib liberty and stuff. And black people were robbed. Trying to still find, trying to find liberty. Um, but what's cool though about slave religion is that it was not just based on Christianity. It was what we call the syncretism between West African traditions and Western European Christianity. Right? So you have these people from West Africa coming and blending traditions with Christian traditions. So you have this unique mixture of religion. Right? So voodoo, voodoo would be the perfect example of that. Of this mixture between Christian beliefs and West African beliefs. Yoruba beliefs, in particular, for voodoo. <clears throat> um, every every plantation will have its own self-proclaimed conjurer or preacher. Uh, most of these were women, right? so these were uh, powerful individuals that had a knowledge of these beliefs and these rituals and stuff. Uh, even though it was prohibited by law to gather for slaves to gather without the supervision of a white person. This happened nonetheless, right? Just secret gatherings of these people. So one of these, or an example of this is capoeira, and this is uh, in Brazil. Capoeira. It's technically a martial arts, but now it's dance. So it's a mixture between martial arts and dance. So slaves, it's a martial it's a martial arts so the way to fight so this is outlaw you know for slaves and they would mask it they would be like no we're not fighting we're dancing so that's capoeira right this mixture between two things right it's another example of syncretism so you have this mixture of religion this beautiful uh unique culture basically what's going on here Right, you're creating this whole new culture. Uh, uniquely African American culture is propping up at this time period. There's no other book I'm going here. <clears throat> so these familial community bonds, there's these church bonds. And in New Orleans, the slaves there, with this mixture with all these other peoples, French, Spanish, Creoles, right? This is like the beginning of like jazz, blues, and R and B, and all that stuff there. Right? So this syncretism of all these beliefs and rituals coming together. And actually, in New Orleans, there was this thing called Congo Square. So anybody doing things on music, right? This is a, in New Orleans. Right, the white people, uh, the city council in New Orleans kind of gave these African slaves a, a city space, a public square, where they could gather and create music. And it was called Congo Square, right? Because most of these people came from the Congo initially. And this is where the most scholars were argue the birthplace of the blues and of jazz was here in Congo Square, where you mix the heavy percussion of the African traditions and then with the uh, strings and the accordion of the French people, right? And the white other uh, 
musicians, the horns and stuff. And you create jazz, you create R and B and stuff. So Congo Square. Really, really interesting, fascinating little history there in New Orleans. So New Orleans, you want to go for some good music, New Orleans is a place of place to go, even today. <laughs> There's some really cool festival called Voodoo Fest every year. So let's talk about resistance to slavery, right? There's a slave culture, another big part of the thing is resistance, right? So you have family bonds, community bonds, you have the church, and then these two things come together and you create resistance, basically, what's going on here. So most of the resistance, the leaders, was rebel leaders, were either freed men or preachers. And this will be part of the black struggle for liberation, even into the 60s. Think about Martin Luther King, he was a preacher, right? A lot of these freedom rights move, uh, fighters were preachers, especially for the black culture, for the black freedom movement. And this begins over here in this 1800 era. So you have uh, different forms of resistance, not just outright rebellion. That's the most obvious one of how to resist rebellion, revolution, right? The Haiti Revolution by Toussaint Levator. You kill the white owner and you take liberty in your own hands via violence. But that was kind of not that normal or common in the U.S. Um, especially when you were, when the system of slavery was so over, was so overseen, so well mm, structured. The law was all against you, and to rebel was basically calling for suicide. So there was no successful rebellions, slave rebellions in the U.S., to get out of the way. There was a couple big ones but never, never any successful ones. The only really true successful slave rebellion was Haiti, in Haiti, the Haitian Revolution. But there was different forms of resistance. Right? This is what we called everyday forms of resistance. Uh, you didn't have to rebel to resist slavery. So one way to rebel slavery was simply by feigning that you were sick, not going to work. Uh, by sabotaging tools and in, 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 uh, farm uh, equipment, so you can't work. Uh, other way up to poison the, the, the mistress and the slave owner. Right, so the everyday forms are, are resisting, uh, stealing food. Right, if you were a cook or a baker, if you were a slave, you would burn the biscuits for like a really important dinner. That was a form of resistance, right? Just sabotaging, right? Little things. Um, stealing goods, stealing, um, stealing food became so common <laughs> that even some psychiatrists were like, "This gotta be just like genetics. All the slaves steal food. It's just something wrong with them." <laughs> when it was like, "No, it was like a big fuck you to these people," right? It's like, "No, fuck you." And get this fruit for myself. And so there's different forms of resistance, not just rebellion. Okay, it's what we call silent sabotage. Right, poor work, breaking tools, abusing animals, uh, just disrupting our right, production. Uh, another way to resist was to steal yourself, <laughs> to escape, basically. Right, the fugitive slave, just run away. Right, that was also a big form of resisting. Such a big form that they, we even made laws against that, right? The fugitive slave laws. That if we, if we were even from the free north, it was against, it was, it was law. It was, it was your lawful duty to return fugitive slaves, even in the north. Right? Um, we had the underground railroad here to help us escape here, the fugitive. I mean, the most famous one being Harriet Tubman, of course. And when we talk about the Underground Railroad, it's not literally a railroad that's like underground in tunnels, like a subway. <laughs> no, it's not. It's like just a network of abolitionists, of both black and white individuals that want to abolish slavery. And what they would do is that they had like stations, but these stations were nothing less than just homes, people's houses. So let's say you were a runaway slave and you were from the deep south, somewhere in Mississippi, you would stay in some people's houses along the ways. 
as you go north up to a brief thing. That's the Underground Railroad. And people like Harriet Tubman will make it easier, right? Will provide transportation between these stations and stuff for, for food or protection. And all, it's estimated that she did about 70 people, about 70 something, almost close to 80 people that she rescued herself. Uh, but throughout the whole thing, it's about over about 40,000 individuals that were here. It's enslaved with this whole network that's called the Underground Railroad. And so it's just a network of abolitionists helping people move north. So from 30,000 to 40,000 fugitives, they have to escape. <clears throat> um, all right. It didn't uh, undermine the institution of slavery itself, but the importance and significance of fugitive slaves was that it did undermine the rhetoric that slavery was a good thing, that slaves were happy, right, being taken care of, right, by this paternal slave owner. Totally undermined that rhetoric. It's like, no, these people are obviously not happy because they're running away, putting their risk in their lives bringing away. So that argument for pro-slavery, that these fugitive slaves put a big dent on that. And then, of course, slave revolts. The final thing we're going to talk about. Actual rebellions, slave rebellions in the U.S. One of the most, let's talk about like three main ones. We already talked about one, so I'm not going to go over that. We're going to talk about three other ones. So the one we talked about before was Gabriel's Rebellion, this barber stuff in Richmond, Virginia, I think it was. That was one rebellion that was kind of big. Uh, it was a conspiracy, really. It didn't really take off. Killed a couple of white people, suppressed. But the most famous one uh, is going to be the Amistad. This happened in 1839, 1840. So the Amistad was actually this ship name of a ship, the Amistad. It's actually a movie out there. It's really kind of, it's really actually really good. Recommend that. Actually, you could do extra credit for that. If you, if you watch the Amistad, the movie, and write a half-page report on that. I mean, what it is and how it relates to this right here. So it's a ship, the Amistad, transporting um, slaves from one port in Cuba to another port in Cuba. Okay. However, the slaves rebel. It's a mutiny. The, the, the Muni and the Amistad, and they take over. They kill the captain, and they take over. And they, or they actually force the captain, sorry, to go towards Africa, to go back to Africa. So the captain is like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take you guys back to Africa. Don't kill me. He takes them to the U.S. Or he kind of like takes them around in circles, hoping that he's going to get captured by, uh, I think it was Spanish, people, or French, I forgot who it was exactly. But they get captured by Americans, by the Coast Guard, right in the north, off Long Island, off by New York, Long Island, New York. So we have President Van Buren, I talked about this guy last time. So Van Buren is all about, like, let's return these slaves to Cuba, right, and let's get rid of this little debacle. But you have John Quincy Adams, right, the son and the former president, uh, John Adams, uh, he's arguing. It's like, actually, like, we can't just give him back because this is in violation of the abolition law of 1808. This is in violation of the transatlantic slave, you know. These people are coming from Africa. And if we, you know, take them into custody and take them back to, to Cuba, we're violating the law. So we need to free them says John Quincy Adams. So it's because it was a really long court battle. And long story short, they get their freedom. Right? And this kind of like freaks out people in the South. Like, holy shit, you know, our institution of slavery is in danger now. Right? They could get their freedom, they go to the Supreme Court now. It depends on who's, you know, defending them. So most of them go back to Africa. Some of them go to Mexico. And stuff like that. All right. Um, another uh, case like this is a Creole. It's another ship. 
and this one was seized off of New Orleans, and it was going from New, it was going uh, from Virginia to New Orleans, a whole bunch of slaves, and <clears throat> it was going to the Bahamas, to Britain. Again, uh, the leader, or a slave leader, the Madison, Madison Washington, was his, was his name, uh, took over the ship. They were trying to go back to uh, to the Bahamas, where slave was finally outlawed. Uh, they got they got intercepted by the Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard, they break the tobacco, and they get freed as well. Okay. So the Amistad and the Creole, right? Some court cases that was turning the tide against slavery here. Then we have some outright revolts. Um, we have uh, Vesey's conspiracy, 1822. We have Denmark Vesey. This guy is actually a slave carpenter. <laughs> he wins the local lottery <laughs> and he buys his freedom. All right, so this poor slave uh, buys the lottery, like he wins the lottery, buys his freedom, and he's like, fuck it, you know what? I'm gonna go and make a conspiracy and do a slave rebellion. I have money now, I have some people backing me. Let's free the slaves here. All right, he's from South Carolina. Uh, he's actually also a preacher. He's very well read. He's a very pretty intellectual. He's a well read guy. He's from the African Methodist Church. Uh, and Denmark's Vesey's conspiracy reflects the combination of American and African influences to create this unique African character, African American culture. Long story short, it gets discovered. Right? He's not just successful. Um, he's 35 slaves among them Vesey get, they get executed uh, three of these slaves belong to the governor of South Carolina he actually tried to get us involved and try to freeze them his three slaves so their property he's going to lose the money there but no they, they all they go to the court and they're all found guilty and they kill them and about another uh, 50 get banished from the state. So this is Vesey's conspiracy. The other one that's a little bit more of a threat to the peculiar institution of slavery was Turner's Rebellion, Nat Turner's Rebellion. So this guy was also a preacher, uh, this religious mystic, also he was from Virginia. And he thought that God has chosen him to liberate slaves from slavery liberate all the black people from slavery. So he actually chose July 4th for a reason. But he got sick on that day for like a whole month. He got the flu or something. And so he had to extend his conspiracy, his slave rebellion, all the way up to August 22nd. So he and about a handful of his followers, uh, they actually went from farm to farm. <laughs> and they started just started, started killing us, as much white people as they could see. Killing them. Um, so this guy, uh, most of these people he killed are women and children, because the men were out at this religious revival gathering on some other state, and it was, it was mostly women and, and children that he killed. Um, but basically, though, this this uh, this guy actually did it. Okay? This guy actually went out and actually killed people. Um, maybe it wasn't from the militia that uh, suppressed them and killed them as well. About 17 people got killed when they suppressed the rebellion. Um, it would have been a big thing. It was, it was gathering steam. Um, but Nat Turner's rebellion, it was the last, the last large-scale rebellion, slave revolt in the U.S. After this, we didn't see no slave revolts, at least at this magnitude. Um, the significance of Nat Turner's rebellion is a couple of significant. It's a couple of things. First of all, is that it demonstrated the dominance that white people had over black slaves, black subjects. Right? Even a coronated slave rebellion like Nat Turner's could be suppressed. 
because white people were unified. Not just the, plan, the, the slave owners themselves, but the poor white people were also unified against black people, against the, white, the slave fugitives and slave revolts. So that's that. Uh, they were outnumbered. Uh, there were white people were uh, better armed and unified. So rebellion was out of the question. That was the what Nat Turner rebellions gave us. We, that's just can't do that no more. Another thing that happened is that there was a debate in some of these states in the South whether to abolish slavery or not, to avoid further or further rebellions. Instead, what happened was the opposite, that most of these southern states further solidified their stronghold against their slaves. So instead of moving towards emancipation, for example, the Virginia legislature in 1832, as a direct result of Nat Turner's rebellion, decided uh, to prohibit blacks whether you're a free black or a slave from becoming a preacher, from uh, owning firearms, and from teaching other slaves, other black people to read. This became a standard uh, laws for most southern states after 1832. So there was a, a great reaction in the South, and basically it just strengthened the, the, the stronghold of bondage and slavery. So instead of emancipating these Southern people, these Southern plantation owners uh, took away liberty from these slaves. See what I was in. I think that's pretty much it. All that I have. What we're gonna see in the next chapter, I really don't want to jump to that, is just reformation movement, a lot of reformations. So you see the abolition movements becoming really, really big. And all these reformation movements, people against alcohol, you see that. People against corruption. So a lot of changes are happening in this time period. And it's all now because slave at this time period, after 1831, 1832, slavery is now up in debate. For decades, we would just compromise with slavery. We would put that on the back burner because it was a really volatile debate. After Nat Turner's rebellion and after this great reaction of the South, is strengthening their hold on slavery instead of going towards emancipation. The debate of slavery becomes a hot topic now for the whole nation after 1832, which the next couple of chapters are going to show how we get to eventually civil war. So again, slavery, whether you were in the North or the South, it impacted you somehow. And it's one of the worst chapters in US history right, to deal with that we benefited off of people's back uh, in brutal ways. And slavery have not, has not gone away. Slavery is still a problem. And just because we don't see it in our, in our very eyes, you know, it's, it's still alive. Or we have things like workshops. We have poor little kids making our shirts for us. You know, so these things that are happening in 1800 through 1860 are still very much alive with us, unfortunately. Um, there's sort of a, a very good uh, resource here if you're interested about 
modern day slavery. And it's called the Global Slavery Index. I'll leave you this with that, with, with this. Global Slavery Index. So www.globalslaveryindex.org. And you can find um, estimates of people that are enslaved today in a country by country basis. So slavery has not gone away. If anything, it's become more professionalized and hidden and thus more insidious than we can even imagine. So anyways, um, this is chapter 11. We'll continue with chapter 12, the age, I think it's called the age of reform. So we see all these reformation movements, uh, the anti-slavery movements, abolition movements. We have utopian societies. Um, we have uh, common schools, we have uh, uh, prohibition uh, movements. Um, we just see how, basically, this next chapter is going to set up how divided the United States actually is. Okay, so this is a chapter on slavery. Can I hate this chapter a little bit? Let's we'll talk about better things in the next chapter. Right. Hope you guys have a good night. Stay safe.